Uh, tell us about your academic uh, qualifications. CJ, I, I hold a, a BURIS from TEF, an LLM, and a PhD from Essex, an MBA from UCT, and an advanced diploma from where? And there is a human rights diploma from University of Strasbourg in, in France. Yes. Um, when did you begin your practice of the law? We'll come to the lectureships uh, side later. When did you begin your practice of the law? Actual practice, I started in 1996 after doing pupillage. Where did you do your pupillage? I did my pupillage in Johannesburg. And uh, when did you become a member of the Cape Bar? 2004. 2004. Um, tell us a bit about your practice. What, what, what does it entail primarily? Of late, my practice entails Medical, medical negligence law, uh, procurement law, and uh, whatever is thrown at me by the attorneys in yes. between. And um, when did you get involved in the, in the academic world? It started in 2008. Whilst I was here at, UC, at, at in Cape Town, I was uh, approached by one professor at UCT who who said that they would like to they would like me to come and assist as and when requ uh, required, and that is when I was appointed uh, an adjunct professor. Then I present seminars to postgrad students. I pull mark uh, assignments, research papers, and there was an occasion where I co-examined a PhD. Yeah. And um I noticed that uh, you had a stint on, uh, was it, uh, were you, you were a journalist? Yeah, well. Uh, Lebois, you worked for Lebois, Lebois Times. Times at yes. Times, isn't it? Yes, Lebois Times. What, what did you do, just in passing? Just just wrote general s stories. That's where the, I, I, I developed what what I might call now some some modicum of ability to to write uh, it wasn't it wasn't a job really it was okay. it was a freelance freelance position where i submitted stories as, as and when i i had the time yes and why do you want to be a judge uh, cj i I'm sure this committee has, has had this before, uh, and it might sound like a cliche now. I would like to, to pay back what I have learned over the years. I, I wish to contribute to my country, to the judiciary. And most importantly, CJ, for me, this is a, it's a promotion. I've been a sunk. There is <coughs> I cannot go any higher where I am now. And I have learned certain things. And uh, I think it will be important to, to impact that and, and make a contribution from, from the bench. And for how long have you been silk, by the way? This is my sixth year. And, uh, it's been it's been a a rewarding experience 
Well, I'm not going to ask you anything about your acting instinct. I think it's better handled by the JP. JP? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Advocate Madima, good morning. Good morning, sir. Um, I'm happy I didn't greet you in Venda because you'd have responded in Shangan. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Advocate Madima, you've acted quite a number of occasions in the Cape High Court. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. And then in my division, oh sorry, in the Houting division, uh, I don't know if I'm correctly reflecting your acting stints, but I've got 18 weeks there. Uh, does that accord with your own record? Yes, it does. Thank it does. you. And in fact, the last one was a term long allocation, which we discussed to say you've had two short ones, but you, for you to have a feel of what it means to be a judge, you need to be in the division for the whole term. And you gave me that, you remember? I did give you the term. How did you find that? Was it heavy? Was it daunting? Did it say anything to you? Uh, the first three weeks were very difficult, very difficult. And I kept, I kept on saying to myself, will I be able to do this? Do I want to do this? Because I remember in my first week, I, I was on an opposed motion. And for the Monday, I had about 70 files. For the Wednesday, another 70 files or thereabout, the Friday, and I spent the weekend at the office and I kept on saying, I, I don't think I'll be able to do this. I don't think I'll be able to do this. The second week, I was on opposed motion. I had 15 files. The third week, I was back on unopposed. There was really, it was, it was very, very difficult. And, and had it gone that way, I, I don't think I'll be sitting here. But what I can say is that in my third week, I started getting the hang of it. You know? And uh, from there, I, 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 was, I was quite happy. I was quite happy to, to do that. And uh, it is good that I acted in Pretoria other than just being appointed without being acting. I would, I would not have had any appreciation of the amount of work that Pretoria and Johannesburg judges go through. Th thank you for that. Um, I've also asked you to do a spreadsheet or a list of judgments that you, you've penned whilst an acting judge. Um, you, you did that, I think you penned, you, the list shows about 41 judgments, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 42. 42 judgments, yeah. What I need to check with you, you know that uh, the issue of reserve judgments is a problem. Now, judgment number 20 um, appears to have been a 12-month reserved period. Is it 20? Um, no, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong spreadsheet. But yes, number 20. It is number 20. Yes, it should be 20. Yeah. yeah. It seems to be a 12-month reserve period. Is that correct? It is correct. What was so particular about that one that it took you so long? There was nothing particular about it. And I have apologized profusely to the DJP for that. And I'll tell you why and what happened there. When I left, uh, when my acting stint ended, I had four reserve judgments. And when I was back in my chambers writing those judgments, with this one in particular, I could not find anything in the file. And then I returned it to the office of the, of the JP in Pretoria. Because I could not remember really, why, why am I having this file? There is nothing in there. And the DJP called me some eight, nine months later to say, hey, when are you delivering this judgment? I said, what judgment? And then he told me about it. I had returned the file. So I drove back to Pretoria. I uh, went and looked for the file. We could not find it. What had happened there, uh, JP, was that I had 
made an order on that file and it was never put on the, the court file. That's why when I was back in chambers and I was writing the rest, I could not understand why, why is this file here? So when I returned it, I returned it in that light. And I can tell you when the JP, the DJP called me, I did that judgment over, I think, over just over a week. And I went, I apologized, and I told him that this is not me. You know, had I, had I known, I would have dealt with the judgment just like the others. Um, yeah, it, it worried me when I saw yeah. that, but uh, you've given an explanation as to why it took 12 months. Um, my first discussion with you to avail yourself, I said to you, as JP, I've never appointed a black male silk. You remember? I do. In fact, I said I've never appointed a black silk. Not because I'm not inviting them. I invite them, they were not available, and that's when you took the bait to come. You're a silk. Uh, have you led any teams, either in the Concord or in the SCA? No, I haven't led any teams in the Concord, but I've been to, this, to the SCA. As lead counsel? Yeah, well, I was the only counsel. Oh, the only yeah. counsel, okay. So you're a bit stingy there. No, I wasn't stingy. No, <laughs> I'm joking with you, Donald. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have quite an impressive list of writings and exposure in terms of labor law. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. So you're, you, you're, you're very well developed in terms of labor. I would, I would think so. I'm not trying to restrict you. Yeah. I know you, you are a general practitioner, yeah. but that was your early part, isn't it? That was my early practice. And, yeah. and if, I may, if I may share with the commission here that uh, my first brief, yes. let alone labor brief, came from my JP when he was, before he became JP in 1996. That was the first uh, labor brief I got to the industrial court in Pretoria. But unfortunately, as counsel, you, you, don't, you can never really decide the type of work you do. Your practice is shaped by the type of uh, work you get from your attorneys. Oh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on a lighter note, thanks for reminding me of that brief. Uh, I, I think the CJ also reminded me some time ago that he also received a brief from me. Uh, I can't remember <laughs> it. <but anyway. laughs> thank you very much, CJ. <laughs> Thank you, um, JP. MEC? Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, good day, Prof. Good day. I'm just keen to know your interest in gambling. Uh, you chaired the gambling board. You also have a company. You are a director of a company, Gambling Indaba. Do you want to be the gambling judge? Uh, no, not really. I. I, I served two terms as chair, chairperson of the, the Western Cape Racing and Gambling Board. Uh, when, I, when my term ended, my second term ended, I think 2013, 2014, I, I got, uh, I was invited by some consortium to, to become, to participate in the in this company, that the Gambling Indaba company that we're talking about. Uh, it had its first expo last year, and uh, it's going to have its second expo at Empress Par Palace this year. Uh, there are no pecuniary rewards, as if I may put it, put it that way, uh, because it's a new company. And I may say, I don't want to be a gambling ju judge, I am going to resign from from that company, not only as not only as director, both as director and shareholder. Maybe I should have started here that uh, as a teacher by profession, maybe I should have wished you uh, the best World Teachers Day today. Uh, so, Thank so, you. So Thank you very so much. Maybe I, I should I should have started there, <clears throat> but. I want to congratulate you and thank you, maybe in the spirit of fees must fall, that you personally support students from your pocket to study in university, especially in the University of Venda, and the support that you 
we have provided to your alma mater school in that area as well. Just to congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you, MEC. Thank you so much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, MEC. Commissioner Helens. Uh, sir, what, what, it, that matter number 20 that was raised with you by the JP, uh, it looked like a trial matter because it's an RAF case. Yes, it was a trial. Um, I, I understand that you had a file with no papers in it, but did you not have your bench book, your notes of the matter, which show you all the cases you did and um, would readily have shown you that you have an outstanding matter? Yes, it would, but and, I, and I, can, I can explain that. When I left, uh, when I left the, when I finished my acting stint, I left my book uh, at the courts, and that could not be found. The file could not be found, you know. So, did you find your book when you wrote the judgment? No, I didn't. How did you write a judgment without any notes about the very matter that you heard? I went back to the pleadings, you know, and, and, and I could remember, not, maybe not all of it, but I could remember most of it. I've acted as a judge, and I, I, I don't understand this. How, you need your bench notes because that's your impression as the matter unfolds. I don't understand how you could have forgotten that you ever heard the matter when even an empty court file would tell you you've got it for a reason. How did you not collect the, connect the court file with the fact that you'd heard live evidence in a matter? And then how can you write a judgment without your notes? Well, uh, yes, I didn't have the notes, uh, but I could, I could remember when I was going through the pleadings, I could remember what unfolded uh, then. And that's, that's how I got to write the judgment. And I may add that uh, if, if the judgment was faulty, if I may use that word, I think either party would have, would have asked for leave to appeal or something like that. I'll leave it at that, but uh, I'm troubled. Um, can you tell us uh, what your judicial philosophy is? Well, and I think that that is the philosophy that each and every judge must have, you know, is to, is to uphold the law, uh, is to adequately look into the facts, marry the law, and come up with a, with a, a fair decision. And how would you, we recognize uh, that it is wrong to, 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 I'm not talking about this matter number 20 of yours specifically, but delayed judgments are, are a bad thing, to put it very uh, flatly. Can you tell us why it's a bad thing to delay a judgment for a long time? Well, simply because justice delayed is justice denied. If you take too long to deliver your judgments, uh, the parties are in limbo, they don't know what is going on. But maybe I can offer a legal explanation. As an acting judge, it is really, really difficult uh, for me, uh, without speaking about uh, other, other acting judges. When you are sitting there as an acting judge, when I am sitting there as an acting judge, half my mind is in my chambers. You know, because it's inevitable, that you can't do much about it. You still get calls from your attorneys, and you keep on telling them, look, I will, I will, I will deal with this thing when I come back. You know, but I want to believe that as a judge now, you will not have those problems of uh, your mind being elsewhere. Uh, it will be focused 100% on what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Helens. Uh, Commissioner Nokesi. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good day, uh, Council. Good day, sir. Uh, my first question is, do you believe in the judicial accountability? And if yes, how that should be navigated in relation to 
without af af offending judicial independence? Well, I believe that judges uh, should be treated like everybody else when it comes to the issues of accountability. I believe that judges, for example, should disclose their financial, uh, their financial dealings without, I don't see how that interferes with judicial independence. Uh, they should be, I, I don't think that judges should be treated any differently from anybody else. Uh, in relation to the judgments that you have given, I mean the list of judgments, for instance, if you go to f the first judgment, the date of hearing is not indicated. In fact, the majority of your judgments, you don't indicate the date of hearing when the matter was heard. We see the date when judgment was delivered. Any particular reason? Yeah, it's w when I was searching uh, in... Especially the, the judgments that I did when I was here in the Cape, in the Cape High Court. Uh, when I was writing them then, 2008 and 2010, at the end I was supposed to have written when it was delivered. So when I was searching, going through them, I could only find the date that I delivered it. But I can assure you that it was never more than a term. It was never more than a term. Now, in relation to the judgment um, that you have explained, the, the delay of 12 months is fine. That was number 20. Can you give an explanation in relation to judgment reflected at number 22 of your list, number 22. where you took nine months before you delivered that judgment? It was more than a term, as opposed to what you're saying. You know what, now that you say that, uh, JP, I think number 20 is not the, the one that I was explaining. It is. Uh, uh, the one that he's referring to. And, and now I recall, that's why I said I made an order. I could not have made an order in a trial. So I made an order in that application. So I think, I think that, is, that is really what happened. Uh, you know. Have you finished, yeah. Commissioner? Oh, yeah. are you still answering? Yeah, I was saying that... Uh, answering. Yeah, there is only one judgment where I took more than a term. So if that is the one, that should be it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really apologize for that. I don't quite remember. In fact, Councillor, I'll take your word because most yeah. of your judgment, you don't reflect when the matter was heard. We only, but I'll take your word. That Thank you. It's only that one, but I picked that up. Thank you, Chief Justice. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner Singh. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I'm, I'm a bit concerned about the response that when one sits even as an acting judge, your mind is elsewhere. Uh, because you said your mind is on your practice. Uh, I would imagine that one sitting there even as an acting judge uh, should uh, apply his or her mind fully to the matter on hand that you're dealing with because that's the only way you can dispense justice in a fair and proper manner. But having said that, I, I also note, Professor, that you have a number of financial and proprietary interests that you've listed. Uh, and you don't say when, whether you are a director, founder of these companies, or you're just a mere shareholder. There's Bashabi Basena Investments, PDY Limited. There's Bashabi Basena Projects, PDY Limited. There's Bashabi Basena Procurement, PDY Limited. There's Hamisi of Sena Investments, Limited. Uh, and then the nature, they, they deal in mining, property, oil, and others. So, and you say you shall resign. Your answer, you shall resign. Now, I think we just need to be told a little more as a JSC, what is your involvement in these companies and for how long have you been involved? Because I think it, it stands to reason that one would have to resign, you know, to give up your business interest. But I just want to know what involvement you've had in this. Well, uh, I, I'm the founder, uh, especially with the Bashabi ones, I'm, I'm a founder with other Bashabis uh, in these businesses. They are not trading. The one, the one, the one that is actively trading is, is Hamisi of Sen. That is my family business. 
and when I say it has got interest in mining or, and across the board, it has got 300,000 shares uh, in the JSC. So it's a diverse portfolio. It's a family business. That is the only one really that, remember the, the, the question is, is companies that you've been involved in in the past 10 years, and that's, how, that's why I listed them. Bashabi, was saying, uh, Bashabi procurement doesn't, it's not trading. Uh, Bashabi uh, uh, investment is not, uh, it's not uh, trading. Bashabi projects, not trading. So. And your influence uh, in, in, in these businesses, I mean, uh, Hamisi of Sena Investment, there might be 300 shareholders, but your. No, 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 300 shares. Shares. You have, have only 300 shares. 300,000. shareholders. You, you also have presented some papers on SOEs and served as chairman of Autopax for two years. You don't say when, because from, you know, reading of Autopax, there was this whole business of buying buses that are parked during 2010 World Cup. There was this business of the conflict with other operators in, uh, in the in Gauteng area where there was allegations of harassment. When, what, at, during what period were you chairperson of Autopax? Uh, uh, I was chairman of Autopax when I was at Transnet, and I left Transnet in 2003, 2004. So the 2010 World Cup staff story, I was not involved at all. I had already left. And, and, and Commissioner, I need to, to, to at least maybe respond about the, my acting stint. And I'm telling you my truth. So when I say that, uh, it is not possible not to think about your practice when you're acting, because you still get calls from your attorneys. You know, other attorneys don't know you're acting. They would call you and say, "Can I give you this work?" And you say, "When is it due?" If it is after your acting stint, you accept it. You know? So, look, like I say, there is a difference between an acting judge and a judge. When you're a judge, that's your full-time job. You, know, you don't have to be worried about what is happening in chambers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Singh. Commissioner Malema. Ndam Mshabi. Mshabi. Bovo. Bovo Mshabi. Bovo Mshabi. Ndam Mshabi wa Hayani. I'm also Mshabi CJ. Yes, so I'm a shareholder in all these companies. Mushabi, <laughs> 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 uh, can you, you just take us through each company? So you say, Bashabi Vasena Investment, what does it have, what does it do? And then go to the next one like that, like that. So that tomorrow when... Uh, they are exposed somehow. They, then you are not accused of having not said yes. one or two things. Thirty-eight. Thank you. Thirty-eight, thirty-nine. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. Bashai Basen Investment uh, comprises of four cousins. Uh, one Hamisi and three Bubas. Uh, I have resigned from that. It's not trading, basically. It never traded. What we used to do here, uh, Commissioner, was every month the four of us would put in 5,000 rands into an account. And, and what happened was that uh, for 18 months we've been putting in money, and uh, one of our cousins defaulted in the payment for three months, and uh, we, we said, no, we can't work that like that, and then we, we disbanded it. Bashabi Basena projects and procurement are subsidiaries of Bashabi Basena. Sorry, uh, Bashabi Basena investment. They're subsidiaries. Never traded. Uh, they are just there in the in the organogram. Uh, gambling in Daba, uh, as I explained, uh, it started last year. It had its first expo. Uh, in gambling here in Cape Town. The next one is now in October in, in Emperor's Palace. Now, I think the, the, the company that 
really, really has value is a Hamisi of Sen, where I said that it holds 300,000 shares in, in companies in the JSC. Uh, the directors are my wife and I, and shareholders, 50% each, me and my wife, and that's it. So, because your wife is not going to be a judge, I think the good thing will be to live here in Hamisi of Sena Investment. What do you think? Look, I... <laughs> Isn't it you said you're going to resign? Yeah, I will resign. So an ideal thing will be to leave the wife there, right? Ideally, yes. But and and you're going to leave here, since we're going to appoint you, leave her there? Uh, look, it, it will depend really, Commissioner, that if it is going to cause conflicts, we'll have to sell this, thing. we'll have to shut down this company and, and uh, walk away. If it's going to cause conflicts, uh, some conflict. I would, I would need to take uh, advice from sitting judges on that to say, are you, don't you have any shares in, in the JSC? If they do, well, I think actually I'll ask my JP. Not, n not now. <laughs> not, <laughs> not now and here. I'll ask my JP, JP, don't you have one share at the JSC? And if he says, I do, I said, oh, okay, fine. If he says, no, it's not advisable to have that. You know, and understand that you can't shift this thing, uh, Commissioner, to your wife, to your children, because has, you're still, a, you know, it, they're still yours, really. If you have to shut down, shut down, and become a judge. No, uh, I'm asking a simple question. Since you're going to be a judge, uh, this is a matter you should have thought about it before you came here. Are you going to resign, you and your wife? Okay, let's ask it differently. Is it correct, let's say you are not going to be a judge. Is it correct for JP's wife to have shares in any trading company? or any other judge? The short answer is no. CJ, I asked a, a Mushabi question. Everybody's answering now. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, because it looks like it's coming to them. All judges are, ask, are answering. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Malema, these are not judges. The short answer, uh, Commissioner, is no. So judges' wives must not have shares in business. Or partners, not, not uh, in husbands, yes, yes, partners, yes. Uh, well, yeah. well, Commissioner, like I said, if it's going to cause a conflict, you got, they, they, must, they, must, they must not be. Mushabi, I, I, I want us to help each other because by virtue of being Mushabi, you know I'm already conflicted. So when we deal with other things later, must be able to, to really take a, a Mushabi perspective. I, we need a clear answer as to, not if, a definite answer from a potential judge. We now, me and you, agree that it is not acceptable for partners of judges to have business interest in any of the companies. I agree. Now, the second one, Mshavi, um, is uh, half your mind. Before we go to the half the mind, you said there is a difference between an acting judge and a fully appointed judge. Maybe you must take us into confidence on what is the difference between the two well the, the different the difference is not is not fatal when i when i said that there was a difference between an aj and a judge i was referring only to when an aj is in the judges chambers performing the functions of a judge he has another job uh, commissioner remember so it is inevitable that half the mind will always be there. 
uh, in his other job. Now, with a full judge, there is no other distraction. This is your job. This is your full-time job. There is nothing else you do. No side uh, jobs. It's just the one job. That is the only difference I meant. I didn't mean the difference in the execution of their duties. No, it's the same. I think the CJ will allow me to just spend some time with you because I have a problem here. Now, why do you accept things that you are not going to apply your full mind into them? When I perform my functions as an AJ, I apply my full mind. When I'm in the judges' chambers as an AJ, inevitably, I still have to think about my practice. I don't shut down my practice when I become a judge. I suffer great prejudice, actually, when I am an AJ, because I cannot take the work. But it doesn't mean that I cannot think about the work. We have a, a half-minded judge listening to me with a half-mind and going to apply a full mind when you make a judgment. Because when you make a judgment, you, you are still not in your practice. You are still acting. So this half mind only applies in court. When you leave the court to write, you all of a sudden have a full mind. You, you all of a sudden forget about your practice. You all of a sudden don't receive the calls from other attorneys because now you are writing a judgment. Commissioner, when I say half the mind is in my chambers, I don't mean that... That, that, that half mind is occupied all the time. I don't mean that. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. You see, it wouldn't make sense. Shabi, let's agree you made a, a terrible mistake. Let's agree you made a terrible mistake. You cannot apply half a mind in a matter that when judgment is passed carries the same weight as the judgment of a full-time judge. I concede. Now, the last point I want to make, you see this, uh, uh, I agree that you, you now accept that we, we really made a terrible mistake. Now, here a judge comes into a courtroom, and I've seen it in in a, in, in your court there, in, in, in Houting. A judge comes into a courtroom and then pretends like he or she has read the, doc the documents, and then the counsel advises the judge, and she, he even makes mistakes of saying, no, I know this matter talks about one, two, three, four. And then they say to the judge, no, that's not the matter. The matter is a different one, it's one, two, three. Confirming that the judge did not read the matter before him or her. What happens in that case? Do you abandon the case or do you proceed with it? When you are now exposed, you have not read the documents because the case you referred to is not the one before you. Well, uh, Commissioner, most often than not, the judge would have read, uh, would have read the papers. It is only in, in, in civil trials where, where the judge gets the file the, for the first time in the morning. Yes, of course, the judge would not have read that. That's how it works. But... Where a judge makes a mistake about this case is about A, B, C, uh, it, could be, it could be a mistake because that he would be having a whole pile of files. He could be referring to another, another case. No, 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 no. We're not talking about whether a judge can make a mistake or not, Mshad. A judge has made a mistake already in court already. And it says, no, this matter relates to the following matter and takes 10 minutes to explain what the matter is about. And when he, she finishes, they say, no, that's not the matter before you. This is the matter before you is the following matter and all that. And now it's clear that the judge made a terrible mistake. Leave, 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 leave those things of saying there are so many cases. I'm, I'm, I'm appearing before you. I'm not interested in so many cases. I'm interested in my case. Whether you know my case, and this is a trial starting. It's not a first appearance. We're now starting the trial. The judge, can he or she still proceed after being exposed that this matter before you, 
You have not read anything about it. Commissioner, I would, I would proceed. You will proceed to listen to a matter you don't know yeah. anything about. Yes, I would proceed and listen to the parties. Remember, Commissioner, this is not me. This is a hypothetical, hypothetical case. So I don't, I don't mind that. No, no, we, you, you, I'm asking it so that I can judge your judgment. Because you are going to be a judge. A judge must have a proper judgment. So if you are going to proceed listening to a matter that you have not read, what is the significance of filing papers before? Let's just file them in the morning. Commissioner, as I said, hypothetically, I would listen to the matter. At the conclusion of the matter, I would ask the parties to provide me with heads of argument, and then when I write my judgment, I will have the whole spectrum of the facts and the law that I need. Remember, Commissioner, it's hypothetical. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner Malema. Prof? Thank you, CJ. Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon. I'm also a professor. <laughs> so I gather. <laughs> We're on the same level. <laughs> Prof, since 2008, you have been appointed adjunct uh, professor at UCT. But I'm looking at your publications that there's no publications post-94. So my question is whether now your scholarship has not been limited in terms of how you infuse the values of the new dispensation uh, in your judicial reasoning and application of the law. Because you have not touched anything about the Constitution since 1994. Yes, and, and there, is, there is an explanation to that. Uh, all my publications are pre-94 because I was, I was uh, in academia then. I was at VITS. That is when I wrote. And once I left academia, very, very difficult to write uh, anything. Very, very difficult. Yes, I concede. I, I have not written anything post-1994. And uh, yeah, as you know, an academic environment demands of you to publish. Maybe you have different requirements as institutions because as an adjunct professor as well, you are still required to publish on behalf of the institution where you are appointed. Hence, I was refer referring you to 2008 being appointed at UCT uh, as an adjunct because that's one of the requirements that <coughs> you do publish for the institution. But let me leave it there. It's fine. Thanks. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Advocate uh, Madima. Uh, <coughs> You do not appear before the JSC for the first time. Can you remind us when you were last before us, uh, before this body seeking appointment? I was here in 2008 for a position in the then TPD. Yes, um, <clears throat> it was quite a hectic uh, interview. You, I'm sure, will agree with me. I will agree with you. It was hectic. Uh, and in retrospect, I think the commission made the right decision. Yes. Since that interview and uh, drawing from the lessons uh, offered, what is it, uh, in your opinion, that you did um, between then and now uh, that you are again seeking appointment? to put yourself in better stead uh, and enhance your prospects of appointment uh, or generally uh, to improve your um, career prospects uh, in whichever way? You know, when, when I was not... advancement, sorry. When I was not appointed in 2008, I'd, I'd had eight years to reflect. Uh, there is a saying in Venda which says that basically it means that loosely translated would mean that uh, everything really happens for a reason. 
I was not appointed in 2008. I, three years later, I took silk. You know, and I, a, a year later, uh, 2009, I was appointed at the competition tribunal. So I, I've had occasion to, to, to gather a lot of experience in, in other areas which I now believe uh, should stand me in good stead. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Acting President Maya. Commissioner Didiza. Thank you very much, uh, CJ, and uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, sir? I'm all right, and you? I'm good. Um, I just want to follow up the issue raised, the question rather raised by Commissioner Malima, but in a different way. Um, I must say that the issue raised about acting, you know, positions while we are still running a practice does pose difficulties. In your own view, because I think some may not have stated it the way that you've stated it but it might be a challenge. Do you think there's something that needs to be done by the JPs to give support to ensure that, you know, that worry of the other half does not become a bearing factor in the work that we have to do? Because there's no other way that you can be asked to act. Um, you would still have to run a practice at the same time on acting. I'm just wanting your view whether you think there's anything that ought to be done. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, to the JPs around here, I would, I would really ask that uh, uh, we be given two days in a week to write judgments whilst we are acting, you know, just to, to give us some breathing space. Commissioner, in Pretoria and Johannesburg, there is no breathing space. You know, it, I, I, I realized that if appointed from the day, from the first week of my appointment until the last week of my retirement, I shall always have reserve judgments if I'm in Pretoria or Johannesburg. That's how difficult this, the, the space is. Is it because of the workload or what is it? What is the reason for that? CJ, it is because of the workload. You, you need more judges. Yes, we need more judges. Uh, and I know that it takes time, but in the meantime, the CJs, the, the, the JPs can give, us, can give us a day or two to write. You know, but again, uh, CJ, in all fairness, uh, in, in our last week of acting, we do get the time to, to write our judgments. Yes. Very well. Commissioner Nzebeza. Thank you, Chief Justice. Now, Advocate <coughs> Nadim, in the new reclamation group case in the competition tribunal, I see that you sat with one of the commissioners in this body. Um, they wrote a concurring dissenting, concurring separate ruling in which um, they sought to clarify aspects which they felt had not been dealt properly, not properly, but sufficiently clear, clearly by, by you. Did you accept that clarification to have been well made? You know the judgment I'm referring to yes. for the finding? Yeah, on page 129? <sighs> I think it is. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the reasons for their decision and order start on page 130. And uh, they've got a half a page of concurring but separate 
ruling in which they they say in paragraph two or paragraph one but for the sake of clarity and further guidance to Mr. Jacob, we had the following. I don't think it was a violently different point, but I don't know if you still remember to what degree you, you felt that their clarification was opposite. Or did you <coughs> disagree with their clarification but you accepted it for what it was. Well, yeah, as, as you, you, you put it, uh, Commissioner, this was in 2011. Uh, look, I was I was happy that they concurred with with the with the judgment. Mm. Second thing, you don't seem, in spite of your having sat in the competition tribunal for a number of years, you don't seem to have attracted as a private practitioner work in that area as one would have expected you should have done. I'm not blaming you. Do you think there are reasons for this? Or what do you think are reasons for this? Africa, black people or black council do not seem to be very much engaged in that area of the law including people like you who have sent in the tribunal. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, your fellow Commissioner who sits, who's, who sits with you now and who sat with me at the competition tribunal will tell you that uh, in the five years I was at the tribunal, I have not seen more than three black practitioners appearing before us at any given time. Uh, that is the story of my country. When I came to practice law in Cape Town, I was naive thinking that I'll come and do maritime law work. In the 12 years I've been here, I had just one matter with a silk. We did an answering affidavit and that was it. I left the competition tribunal three years ago. In a normal country, who better to brief than a judge who sat at the competition tribunal? I'm still waiting. In the first year I thought maybe there is a cooling off period. I'm still waiting. Is it so that the Competition Commission is a commission of the Republic's democracy? You know, Commissioner, I don't complain about work not coming, coming to me from the Commission. The Commission has so much work. I complain about work that should be coming from the parties. And that is the one that is not forthcoming. And where the commission is a party? Where the commission is the party, the commission does, and those are the three that I was talking about. The commission does brief those three black, black practitioners, and I have, no, I have no problem with that. And the private sector? That's the one I'm complaining about in my country. Mm. I've not seen... black practitioners appearing before the tribunal emanating from from uh, being briefed by private parties. Yes, the, the big law firms will come there with uh, attorneys who work in the firm, yes, but uh, I've not seen counsel re uh, representing private parties to any significant uh, uh, degree. Thank you, Chief Justice. 
For what it is worth, that's what I've seen at the Constitutional Court in relation to these uh, competition matters. You hardly ever see a black person there. Anyway, uh, Commissioner Ngozi Thomas. Thank you, Chief Justice, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Madima. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, you s spoke about uh, a transformation story of my country in response to a question from Commissioner Zibeza in relation to your exposure to, um, to work in the competition law space. I, I just want to, 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 to probe you because um, state entities, uh, SOCs, state-owned companies and government, those are the target, targeted, uh, target market, if you like, for um, addressing skewed briefing patterns. Now, you were at Transnet for seven years, and I must say I've been very fortunate to receive good work from you, but let's just uh, find out from you, you know, from your learnings, your experience as general counsel, what it is that we can do to address this very issue that you refer to as the transformation story of my life that uh, sees us not getting enough people into the competition law space and so on. Thanks, Commissioner. I think that the people charged with this type of responsibility must want to do it. You must want to empower uh, what I've noticed is black council don't get the work white council get the work, they still lose. So it can't really be about competence. It can't be. And just to interrupt the uh, Commissioner Nkosi Thomas, the few blacks that have appeared, by the way, in competition matters before the Constitutional Court were so exceptionally good. Has that been your experience as well? Yes. Uh, uh, when we sat, we sat in the competition tribunal, I don't want to be mentioning names of counsel here, but they are very, very, very good. And the question we kept on asking ourselves is, now, if this guy is so good whilst acting for the commission, why is he not getting work from the other side? That is the question. That's why I say you must want to do it. You know? And, and wherever, whenever I have a chance to talk to attorneys in big law firms, I say, why don't you adopt this black female junior, just adopt them. Give them unopposed work. Grow them. One day you look with pride and say, she is silk today because I am responsible for that. You, know? I mean, you sit in court there, you find white counsel with 10 files. They could have given this black junior just the one file for the experience and for the little stipend that they should get there. But again, as I said, it comes from the heart. If they don't want to do it, it's not going to happen. Did you get it right during your tenure at uh, Transnet for the seven-year period? Well, I would, I would like to say, yes, I did get it right in the sense that you have 10 instructions and 40 practitioners. The, the 30 will complain. You know, the 30 will complain. That's inevitable. But I am, I am, I am happy, actually. Uh, this morning, I got a call from a judge recently ap appointed in KZN. She was saying to me, tell them about what you did for me. When she was an attorney in KZN, I took it upon myself to empower her with transnet work in KZN. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Acting President Maya. Thank, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, just a quick question, um, Advocate, arising from questions put to you by uh, Commissioner Helens um, a while back regarding matter number 20 or 21, I'm not quite sure which one. You, did I hear you say you conducted a civil trial? Then it slipped through the cracks, you forgot about it, and a year later, you prepared a judgment based only on the pleadings and your memory. Yes, 
Yes, that's what I said. And what about the evidence that was heard in that matter? Look, I, I, Commissioner, I worked with what I heard. And as I said, I, I apologize profusely to the DJP about that. And as I said, the mistake I made, or the mistake that was made, was that the order that I had given was not attached to, to that file. Otherwise, the, otherwise, I would have written it together with the rest, the other three that I did. Big mistake, I concede. It should not have happened, and I'm not blaming uh, the fact that I was an AJ, but I can assure you, I am not like that. It's not going to happen ever again. Th thank you, Chief Justice. Must be extremely embarrassing. I know of one SCA judge who forgot the judgment while she was at the higher court for two years until the story was in the media. You must be very embarrassed, aren't you? Well, is it about me? <laughs> no, it's not about me. It is embarrassing, CJ. Yes, it is, it is and extremely it, if you appointed, I'm sure it will never happen again. Never, ever. And my JP is here, and yeah. I'm sure you'll keep on reminding me that say, no, 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 to remind me to say it should not happen again. Oh, we discipline you if you, if you go past a particular period. We are very strict. Your excuse, sir. Thank you very much, Commissioners.